Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Oh boy, this is going to be loud again, so. <laughs> Jerry's going to try to tune me down a little bit. Well, a warm welcome to all of you as we continue to celebrate the Easter season on the second Sunday of Easter. And today, we especially see how uh, confidence in the resurrection gives us also courage as we share the good news with others in our world. And I invite you to be encouraged as you share that confidence in the resurrection today. Uh, as we worship today, we'll be using the order of service that uh, hopefully you picked up on the way in. And again, a reminder, the Easter hymn is not one that we regularly use. It's a wonderful uh, 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 Keith Getty uh, hymn. We've used it before. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And the music is out on the table if you should uh, need it. A couple of announcements uh, for us uh, today. Um, if you caught the announcements earlier, you saw that the um, M &M MMC met for the first time uh, uh, after finding out that we weren't getting a candidate and established a process by which we will then move toward uh, the call process. So these have been out for a little while and you should have all been received uh, uh, an attachment with an email for a form. They're asking that you get those forms in by May 1st so that we can uh, get our, our request to the district president uh, uh, around May 2nd so that hopefully he can get us a list by our next MMC meeting, uh, which is uh, May 17th. So I want to encourage you to, if you have a name to submit, I think I've gotten about six uh, already, so uh, uh, we need those by May 1st. Uh, also, uh, on May 15th, the... Um, the, uh, the council is going to be holding a town hall meeting, and, and the purpose of that town hall meeting is to invite you to participate in uh, sharing a little bit about what you would like uh, to see them work through in this call process. And uh, I'll be gone that weekend, actually. Pastor Poppy will be preaching that weekend, but then in place of the Bible study, they'd like to have a call, uh, a town hall meeting. It's not a voter's assembly, but it's just an opportunity for them to ask questions of you, to get your input, and, um, uh, and then to move uh, so that they uh, have your input as they move ahead with the call process. So uh, that's May 15th. I want to encourage uh, you to be a part of that. Uh, I mentioned in the late service last week that Her Harold Holnagel has gone home to his Lord. Uh, currently, the services are set for, um, I believe it's April 22nd. It's the Saturday that weekend, 21st, 22nd. May, May I'm sorry, May. <laughs> May. Um, and the visitation will be from 9.30 to 11.30. The service at 11.30 at Chapel of the Chimes uh, at Wisconsin Memorial Park. And uh, so uh, we'll put that in the bulletin so that you have it uh, available to you that way too. But uh, just kind of solidify those arrangements. Well, let's uh, rejoice in the resurrection once again. I invite you to join me in singing our opening hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. <laughs>
Hallelujah. We are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Father, if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a few moments and just silently reflect on our own personal need for God's forgiveness in our lives. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, I confess that I am my nature sinful and unclean. I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I have done and by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbors as myself. I justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, Almighty God, His mercy has given His only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a call that ordained servant of the word of Christ and by his authority, I then forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord 
Lord Jesus, you raised me to new life by resurrection faith. Make me strong to me each day with a living hope. Give me ears to listen to your transforming word. Stop doubting and believe. 
Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You may be seated. It's time for a children's lesson. And I see Carter here, so Carter can come up and do a children's lesson. Okay, Carter. I'm going to start today by looking at this thing. Okay. You want to stick a finger up there? No? Because if, 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 I, if you put your finger here and I go like this, what does it do? Huh? It squishes it, doesn't it? We call that pressure. It puts pressure on my finger so that I can hold the wrench this way. And we use all kinds of things to put pressure on stuff. But sometimes people put pressure on you. Not this way. Well, I suppose it could happen if you were wrestling with your dad. And he laid on you, that would be a lot of pressure, wouldn't it? Yeah. But other kinds of pressure that people put on us is they try to make us do things that we know we shouldn't do. Or to not do the things we should do. We call that peer pressure. It's not the pressure of a wrench, but it's the pressure of other people. Uh, sometimes, uh, and sometimes we those things we know we shouldn't do. And sometimes we don't do the things we know we should do because we're afraid somebody might make fun of us or somebody might call us a name. And, and when we're scared, right, when we're scared, then we're not able to do always the things that we can do. And, and today we're going to learn that in the Bible story that, that the disciples were scared. It tells us in the Gospel today that they were in a room and they had the doors locked, they had the windows barred because they were scared. But a little while later, a little while later, they weren't scared anymore. And they were standing in the opening and they were saying, Jesus rose from the dead. And you know what made the difference? They saw Jesus. They saw his hands. They heard his voice. They watched him eat some food. They, um, they were able to walk with him and talk with him. And, and because they know that he rose again from the dead, they didn't worry about the pressure that other people were going to put on them. And, and, and that's what we want to, to do in our own lives, too, because we know that Jesus loves us. He gives us the power to say no when people want us to do things we shouldn't do or not to do things we should do. So let's ask uh, Jesus, just as he helped the disciples to do that, let's ask him to help us do that too. Would you pray with me and pray with the congregation to pray about it? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for showing yourself, thank you for showing yourself to your disciples. To your disciples. They were scared. They were scared. But you took away. But you took away. All of their fears. All of their fears. You made them bold. You made them bold. You made them confident. You made them confident. To do and say. To do and say. The right thing. The right thing. Help me. Help me. Do and say. Do and say. The right thing. The right thing. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up for your show. Let's sing.
Our text is uh, that first lesson from Acts chapter 5 as we consider the implications of what it means for us and what it meant for those original disciples that Jesus was risen from the dead. That, as we said last week, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And it makes all the difference in the world, especially when we think about the call to be bold witnesses in our day and in our age, in our time, in our families, among our friendships, in our workplaces, and in our neighborhoods. Um, so I'd like to start today talking a little bit about bias. Uh, football referees are supposed to be unbiased, aren't they? It's supposed to call a fair game, and uh, uh, I know one of the things you're always concerned about in high school when there were uh, home refs is whether you were going to get homered. Right? In other words, those refs would make more calls in favor of the home team than they would when you were away team. Well, you would think that professional uh, football referees would be totally unbiased. They would never be influenced by fans or uh, by other football players. Uh, but according to uh, a recent study that was done by a stati statistician and researcher by the name of Michael Lopez at Skidmore College in New York, uh, he found that referees are much more likely to make calls uh, in favor of the team whose coaches and players he's standing closest to. That was interesting. Now, how did he come to that conclusion? Well, Lopez analyzed five years of NFL football games. I guess he liked football. Huh? Can you imagine watching all of those games from every one of those seasons? And what, was he, what he was noting is uh, there, that there were 1,400 penalty calls uh, that happened when a referee was near one of the sidelines, one of the benches. And if one player was, for instance, tackling another and it was close to the out-of-bounds uh, mark, if it's within bounds, you and I know it's a legitimate hit. If he's out-of-bounds, then it's considered a late hit and it is a significant, uh, uh, a significant penalty. But because those particular, you know, the, the rate at which uh, NFL uh, play happens is so quick, they call them bang bang plays. Because it's bang bang, you don't get, you don't get a lot of time as an official to uh, uh, to think about it. You just have to make a really quick judgment call. And when Lopez measured how often these kinds of judgment calls went in favor of the team whose coaches were on the sideline closest to where the potential penalty was taking place, he found that referees were much more likely to make calls that complied with what people nearest to them were demanding. In short, intimidation works. Right? You know, when you see a, a coach, whether it's in basketball or football or any other sport, go off on a referee, you say, well, why would he do that? Isn't he just going to uh, irritate that ref? But uh, uh, according to the research, it actually is helpful, not hurtful to the team as long as he doesn't cross the line. Get himself thrown out of the, out of the game. Uh, so yell at the refs, get in their face, and they're more likely to cave to the pressure. Social pressure is a powerful force, and it takes uh, either a special kind of person or a special kind of power to stand up to it. How do you stand up to social pressure, especially when it comes to your faith? Where does your courage come from? Last week, we heard that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and we know that eventually it transformed the way that the disciples reacted in the face of very significant pressure. And I think one way to express, I think, what our, our text teaches this morning is this way, that resurrection confidence brings resurrection courage. In other words, when I'm extremely confident that indeed Jesus did rise from the dead, that he's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, that he's the Savior of the world, and he's the only one who can bring the joy and peace that I need in my life to me and to others around me. It transforms the way that I deal with the pressure to not say much about it. And 
And we see this happening because as we heard in the gospel lesson, even after the resurrection, where were the disciples? They were scared. They were in a room together, locked, did windows, locked doors. It says for fear of the Jews. And yet, just 50 days later, they're standing in the middle of the temple saying, Jesus Christ, the one you crucified, rose from the dead. And they did it in spite of the immense pressure they were under to not say what they said, to not testify to what they testified to. Now, we are going to get to the whole of chapter uh, 5 of Acts where our text is. Uh, but at the end, you've got to know what happens is, okay, they get out, they're preaching in the temple, and then they get uh, brought before the Sanhedrin again. The Sanhedrin says, you've got to stop speaking the name of Jesus. One of the famous verses in the Bible, Acts 5.29, they say in response, we must obey God rather than man. And, and then uh, they are debating what to do with them. Gamaliel stands up and says, well, listen, you know, there have been other uh, messianic figures in the past in Israel, and he names two of them. And he says, this one rose, and, and he ended up getting killed. This one rose, he ended up getting killed. And then, then he says to his uh, fellow uh, members of the Sanhedrin, the court, he says, if this is not of God, don't worry about it. This whole thing's going to blow over. Uh, and and Jesus will, the name Jesus in this sense will never be heard of again. But, he says, if it's of God, if it really is a God thing, then it doesn't matter what you do. You're not going to be able to tamp it down. You're not going to be able to extricate it from our world and from our society because if it's a God thing, God will work his will in spite of what you do. And so it says at the end of uh, the text here in these words, uh, in Acts chapter 5. Then they called the apostles in, they flogged them. That's the 39 lashes, 40 lashes minus 1. It was an extreme beating. Remember, Jesus was beaten just before his crucifixion with the hopes that when uh, the crowd saw what a bloody mess Pilate had made them, that when he offered uh, them to say that's sufficient, they would say yes. And, and of course they didn't. They said crucify him. And then they order him not to speak in the name of Jesus. And, uh, and how did the disciples respond? It says they, they rejoiced because they were counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And day after day, they went right back in. In the courts of the temple, from house to house, they never stopped teaching or proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, what's the difference between our gospel lesson Easter evening and a week later, both times having the doors locked for fear of the Jews, and what's going on in Acts chapter 5? Well, what made the difference is that Christ rose from the dead. And they were so convinced of it that nothing would stop them from sharing the light that comes through his name. So let's just walk through our text a little bit today. It starts this way. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. What's Solomon's colonnade? It's a, uh, a long, in effect, hallway supported by these big pillars. This is an artist's drawing of it. It had a wood ceiling over it, and it's a place where people who were making their pilgrimage to, to uh, Jerusalem, whether it was for the three major festivals, when you were supposed to make a pilgrimage, Pentecost, Day of Atonement, Passover, or whether it was a place where they could gather out of the elements. It's also a place where rabbis very often gathered their disciples, and they did a lot of, of, of teaching, including a rabbi by the name of Jesus. In John chapter 10, it, it tells us there came the Feast of Dedication. Now, that's a feast that's not in the Old Testament, by the way. That's Hanukkah. Um, and it comes from the intertestamental period. Uh, but Jesus celebrated it. It was winter, it says, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade, this exact same place. He taught his disciples here. And, and so it was not uncommon then for the disciples when they were meeting together to meet together in Solomon's colonnade to share their, their time together. It, it's an interesting location. It's on the east side of what was the temple. It faced the Mount of Olives, and 
the Garden of Gethsemane. And so they could see some of those sites where those things happened uh, in the garden with Jesus and his disciples from this colony. And, and, and it tells us that uh, they're doing miracles. They're uh, signs that would bless and encourage and, and uh, the people. And, and yet they were uh, enduring some, some uh, persecution. And, and there's this interesting uh, uh, line in verse 13 where it says, no one else dared join them. You have to scratch your head and say, why in the world would nobody come and join them? even though they were highly regarded by the people. Well, there's two possible things that could have been behind the fact that people were a little hesitant to join them. One was that they saw the kind of persecution that the disciples had gone through. Now, Acts 5, they're thrown into jail. But that's not the first time they've been in jail. Back in Acts chapter 4, uh, it tells us that the priest and captain of the temple guard and said she came to Peter and John while they were speaking. They seized them, and because it was evening, they put them in jail till the next day when the trial would be held. So they'd already been in jail. They'd already been told, don't preach in the name of Jesus. And, and it's in response to uh, that, uh, that, that Peter says that rather um, specific verse about Jesus being the only way. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name given among men by which you know, uh, they may, may be saved. And what, what Peter does is he says, no, I'm not going to stop talking because Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Savior. He proved it by his resurrection from the dead. And so when they tell them to stop preaching, what Peter and John say to them, well, we, they say this, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things of which we've seen and heard. In other words, we were witnesses to Christ's death and to his resurrection. And we've got to tell people about it. In spite of throwing us in jail, and in spite of after our attacks getting flogged, they kept coming back and back and back. Now that would be one reason why <laughs> some people might have hesitated to join the disciples. Well, I don't want to be picked on and persecuted like they are. And, and then the other reason is just before our text, um, which is the story of Anna, Ananias and Sapphira. You remember that story? It tells us uh, in the end of chapter 4 that, that because of the situation in Jerusalem, the believers got together. They supported each other. And it says they sold some of their property and uh, when, they had, when there was a need and brought that money and gave it to the other believers to be divided up. Um, you can imagine they're undergoing a little bit of persecution at this time and so... You know, maybe they, some got fired from their jobs, who, who knows? But there were needs. <coughs> and Ananias and Sapphira, they sold some property. They brought the money and they gave it to the disciples and they said, here's the money we got for the property, and they lied. They lied because they were trying to make themselves, we assume, look good in front of others. Because what they did is, it tells us in the text, they held back some themselves and they asked them, is that what you paid for? And, and they said, yeah, this is what I'm giving you is what I got paid for. It. And they ended up dead. First Ananias, then his wife came in. She wasn't there when Ananias. They carried Ananias out. And she came in and, and she was asked, is this the amount that you got for the field? Yes, it is. She fell off dead. Now, if you saw somebody do that, might you be a little bit leery about joining these people? So there's, there's a couple of different things that are going on in the background that say, well, you know, and the way you might think about this is that if you make a commitment to Jesus, it's a serious thing. You know, you're all in. If you make a commitment to Jesus, he, he wants not just a piece of you, he wants all of you. And, and some people aren't ready to throw their whole heart into the basket of uh, love and grace in their Lord. And... And so some people were hesitant. But it goes on to say, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord, were added to the number, and now you've got the situation where people are being really attracted to him so much that, um, that Luke tells us that they brought their sick and laid them in the streets so that as Peter was packing, passing by, maybe his shadow would pass over him. And, and you might say, well, where would they get that from? Well, remember back uh, 
when the woman with the issue of blood, that she gets up to Jesus and she says, if I could just touch his coat. And, and that's all she had to do. And it tells us Peter, uh, Jesus said it and says he saw, felt the power go out of him. And she immediately was healed. And, and so you've got that kind of situation. I, if, as long as I'm connected to that healing power. Now, whether a shadow of, of uh, Peter actually healed anybody or this is just what they thought, the text doesn't tell us. Um, but what the disciples had, they wanted. So he says, uh, crowds gathered uh, also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick, those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. And I, I think this is something that we don't think much about in our uh, everyday life, but you and I have what the world needs, just like Peter had, what the people in that surrounding area need. Why can we say that? <coughs> Well, because you and I know, as we have lived under the power and promise of our Jesus, that there are some significant benefits to faith. There are significant benefits to believing that you were created by God and you were gifted by Him. And you have a place in this world because He's given you a place in this world. It gives your life a meaning that people who don't have that understanding don't have. You see? And when you and I uh, come under the sway of Jesus and when we follow Jesus, then, then what happens? Well, we can't hate our brother anymore. We can pity him, but we can't hate him. Because we're to love, yes, even our enemies. Now, if you think about that, what this world needs is they need that kind of love, don't they? Boy, would our streets and our cities be different if people had that kind of love and care for everybody around them? Even their enemies? Would people treat each other differently? What about in our world in places like, yes, Ukraine? If somebody really cared like God does in the Old Testament for the, the widow and the orphan and the foreigner, there, would there be the kind of discrimination? Would there be those who are making widows and making orphans because of their desire for power? You see, the world needs the kind of ethic, the kind of love, the kind of care that God gives to us. He, he calls us to have the same kind of compassion for others that he had for us. He calls us not to exalt ourselves, but to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and in humility love and serve each other. He calls us to work hard in using the gifts, talents, and abilities that he's given us for the sake of one another. And if people did this in this world, wouldn't it be a better place? He calls us to not be covetous, not want what we don't have, but rather to be thankful for what we do. Uh, to, uh, and then be generous with the blessings, the extra blessings that when God pours them into our lives. He, 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 you see, those kind of values uh, that values every life that is being precious, unborn, born, as that values every person as being a person of, of value and meaning. So, so somebody who is created by God, who's one of God's children in this world, have we not all one father, uh, Malachi says. And you see, if if we could share those benefits of faith, that they would bring a healing even greater than the healing that Peter was bringing. That was a physical healing, but you know people are going to get sick again. But when you transform a heart, when you make that heart think and feel in different ways, and, and it stays in that, in that thought, and it stays in that life, and it stays in that faith, it transforms that life for not only the rest of this life, for, but for eternity. And, and to realize that, uh, that you and I have that precious gift to give to this world. And, and yes, the world is going to sometimes uh, quibble about it. That's what it says next in our text, that the high priests, all associates, were members of the party of the Sadducees. They were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. Why were they jealous? Well, it could have been for a couple of reasons. One, because they were in charge of the temple. They, and, and if Jesus was actually a fulfillment of all the sacrifices, well, they're out of a job. 
They're out of work. There's no more sacrifice that has to be made, you know. That's one thing. The second thing is the Sadducees, you know, were that party, that group that didn't believe in a life after death. So the resurrection undermined the very foundation of what they proclaimed to be true, that this is, life is all you get. But they were jealous, and they threw them in jail. And, and it shouldn't have surprised the disciples because, you know, Jesus had said this back in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, when they say, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for the same way the persecuted the prophets who were before you. And that's why you see, when they were flogged, they could walk away saying, we count ourselves worthy of suffering in the name of Jesus. And it was their confidence in the resurrection, <coughs> excuse me, their confidence in the resurrection, their confidence when they ate with him, when they walked with him, when they talked with him, that he lives. That gave them courage to be bold witnesses in the time in which they were living. And so the angel comes to them while they're in jail, opens the doors, and says, go back to the temple courts and tell the people about all this new life. Now, how many of you have had an angel go tell you to do that? You know, me neither. But God has, again and again. Every time I confess my sins and receive his forgiveness, every time I remember his suffering and death when I come to the table, proclaiming his death until he comes again, I'm reminded of the great, deep, and powerful love of Jesus. And as Paul says, for Christ's love compels us. Because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And when you and I live that way, when we share that life, then as the book of Proverbs says, like cold water to a thirsty soul is good news from a far country. You and I can bring the living water to thirsty souls in this world as we also share the love and life that Jesus has given us. And, and, and so it's, it's just an encouragement to go. To go where you are. Uh, with the people God has placed around with your life and, and, and lift up the name of, of Jesus. Uh, share the blessing of his life, of what he has done in your life, how he has enriched and blessed your life, and how he's blessed your marriages, and how he's blessed the way that you have dealt with your children and, and helped to, to grow them, how, how he gives you a different kind of compassion for somebody who is uh, uh, down on their luck, and an open generosity to share with those who have less than you do. You see, when you have resurrection confidence, when you leave, really believe that Christ lives, then you have resurrection courage. And you recognize that you have what the world needs and you want to show up with that courage and confidence in the name of Jesus to share it with those around you. Let's, uh, let me pray about that with you guys, please. Lord Jesus, we just thank and praise you that, uh, that you made your resurrected body evident to your disciples so that they lost their fear and moved out in faith. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to so ensconce in our own hearts and minds the truth of your resurrection that we can walk in bold courage in our world. Uh, bless us so that we might be a blessing to others. Amen. Now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Jesus, the life everlasting. Amen. Let's confess our faith together in the words of Luther's explanation of the second article in this Easter season. I believe that Jesus Christ, the true God, begotten the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me and lost and condemned purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil. Not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live unto him in his kingdom.
God's word for stewards this day from Exodus. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Please so remain standing as we say, what shall I render to the Lord? <laughs>
Lord be with you.
throughout my life, so that on the day of his coming, I may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Now may God, who has brought us from bondage to freedom and from death to life, fill you with his joy. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to each of you his peace. Amen. Hallelujah.